What is multiplayer Minecraft without chat? Not very fun, that's for sure. So let's go on a journey to add chat to my custom Minecraft server that I'm building from scratch in Rust. Oh, and also commands while I'm at it. For an additional challenge, let's do it in just three days. On day one, I started like I always start when adding something new to my server, by looking at the Minecraft wiki. After some reading, I decided to start out by implementing the chat message packet that the client sends to the server each time the player sends, well, a chat message. This packet looks a bit more complex than it actually is, at least for my purposes. It starts off with the only thing that I really care about here, which is the actual message as it was typed by the player. The rest is then related to message signatures, which I'm not implementing for now, as this would require online mode logins, which my server doesn't support yet. Also, I just don't find it that interesting, to be honest. With the code written to decode this packet and the handler created to run each time we receive it, I could just log the message contents to the console to verify that it was working, which it did. <laughs> Success! Sending the message to all players is then also not that difficult. For this, the player chat message packet is used. Again, most of its content is related to message signatures. Interesting here is the global index, which is just a counter that goes up with each message. Receiving two messages with the same number makes the client freak out and quit the server. The UUID is used to mute chat from certain players client side. And then of course we have the actual message right here. Down here we also have the sender's name. This gets used to display, well, the sender's name. It is sent as a text component, which is just an NBT data structure for formatting text. In this case I'm adding a click event that will suggest the slash tell command when clicking on the player's name. Just like the vanilla server. Before I edit the code for sending this packet to my server, I first edit it to my proxy to check out how vanilla Minecraft populates it with data. After I had that working, I decided that it was time to eat some lunch, so I made some pasta. Once I was full, I could continue making chat work. I knew that my player chat message packet implementation was working and I knew what data the vanilla server was sending. So I just implemented it in mine the same way. This did the trick, chat is now working. Well, only for one message though, because I forgot to increment the global index. After fixing that, it was actually finally working. After being so successful already, I dared to go off track a little. It still bothered me that head movement of other players wasn't visible. I first decided to replace all the teleport entity packets with their proper movement packets. This actually worked without issues as before players seemingly fell right through the floor. The side to side head movement was still not working however. Turns out there's a whole packet here that I missed. The set head rotation packet. It just takes the entity ID and the yaw of the head as an angle. This worked perfectly. Look at that smooth head movement. The update entity rotation packet is actually also a bit annoying. It takes the yaw and pitch as a number between 0 and 255, while the set player rotation packet coming from the client sends these as degrees. It took me longer than I want to admit to figure this conversion math out. Anyways, back to chat. Wait, chat was already done, right. So let's look at commands instead. Back to the wiki. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that looks pretty complicated. All the commands and arguments are in this big tree-like data structure. And then there are all these different types of arguments. Of course, I wanted to start simple, so I just tried leaving this big tree data structure out for now. The client will send the chat command packet when the player sends a command. This packet only contains the command as it was typed by the player, without the slash in front. The client, of course, protests any command the player will type as it doesn't recognize them, but it will still happily send them out to the server. Responding to the command is then handled with the system chat message packet. It contains a text component again, just like the player name in the player chat message packet. And then there's also this boolean that dictates whether the message is displayed in the chat or above the hotbar. With this in place, I could implement a simple ping command that just responds with pong. That evening, I also did a little bit of refactoring around how packet IDs are handled. I already talked about this in my upgrading to 1.21.5 video. Back then I added a tray to each of my packet structs that contains a function to get the packet's ID. The problem was that it's not possible to call this function in a match statement. To fix this, I simply replaced this function with a constant. Now I can match on packet IDs. After a restful night, it was time for day two. The plan for this day was to inform the client about all the commands with their arguments. I already knew that this was going to be a bit difficult, so I first implemented the decoding and encoding in my library so I could test it with the vanilla server through my proxy. And just as I guessed, it crashed. Before we look at why though, let's take a look at the required packet. 
the server sends all the command information with the commands packet that seems very simple on the surface. It's just an array of nodes and a root index pointing to, well, the index of the root node in that previous array. Of course, those nodes pack the true complexity here. Each of those represents either a command or an argument to a command. And then there's also the special case of the root node. The first field is a flex byte. This carries information about the type of node we are looking at. Also important is the bit that tells the client if this is the last necessary argument. This is used to discern between optional and non-optional arguments. There are two more bits here that I haven't needed yet, so I haven't experimented around with them for now. Next comes an array of child indices. Those children would then be the next possible arguments. For the root node, this contains all the commands. These indices then tell the client where in the big nodes array these elements are located. The next field is only for redirect nodes, which I didn't look at yet. After that comes the name of the command or argument. The parser ID is where this goes from complex to annoying. There are a little over 50 different types of argument parsers, which are used by the client to validate arguments. Stuff like numbers, coordinates, player names, game modes, and so on. Some of these parsers need some properties. Those are stored here. The string parser has some different options on if it should be a single word or if the entire rest of the command is supposed to be part of the string, for example. Last and almost least is the suggestions type field, which I also didn't use. It has something to do with how suggestions for arguments are handled. Okay, back to why my implementation didn't work. After some debugging, I found out that the command that was passed just before it crashed was the default game mode command. And then it tried to pass its argument with the parser ID 41, which according to the wiki was a time. This of course doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So when I saw that one ID before time comes game mode, things suddenly began to make a lot more sense. I suspected that the info on the wiki page wasn't yet updated to 1.21.5, so I looked around the generated data files from the official server that I obtained in the last video. And in the big registries report, I found just the information I was looking for. Turns out that there were some new parsers and this made the IDs move around a bit. After implementing these changes in my code, things suddenly started working. Then I proceeded to also fix the information in the wiki so that the next person won't run into the same problem. Well, until Mojang changes something here at least. Now it was time to also implement this packet into my server. I started out simple with just my ping command again. After that worked, I tried adding an argument, which to my surprise also worked flawlessly. At this point, I was still creating this node array by hand, which I knew wasn't going to cut it in the long term. To fix this, I started out with creating my own data structure to hold commands and their arguments. The command struct then holds a function that gets called whenever a client sends a command matching with this name here. Once I had that working, I wrote up this function that turns my array of commands into an array of nodes. For processing the arguments, I wrote this recursive function here, which works just fine with arguments that are followed by even more arguments. Doing all this by hand in one big file is obviously not that scalable either, so I created a new file for each command. Each of these command files then has an init and execute function. The init function gets called on startup and adds this command with its arguments to a global commands array. Then when a player joins the game, I turn this command array into the nodes array on the fly and send it to them in the commands packet. I may want to cache this nodes array in the future, but even after adding some more commands, it takes only about a microsecond to generate, so I think I'm still good. With what feels like a pretty solid way to define new commands, I wanted to tackle something more complex. A basic teleport command. My version doesn't support all the vanilla features, but you can already teleport yourself to another player or to some coordinates. This forced me to hand a lot more stuff to the command's execute function, like the global game object and the connection streams of all players. This was of course necessary to update the player's position and to inform all connected clients about the teleport. And that is already everything for day 2. Before I started coding on day 3, I started some pizza dough for lunch. After that, I create a basic tell command to send private messages. Then I also added a panic command that just crashes the entire server. Why? I don't know. At this point, I had implemented everything that I had planned already, but I came up with another feature to work on. The server's console. Right now, it is only used to log some debug messages. Printing chat messages and commands was pretty easy. Writing some more code for reading in chat messages and sending them to all players was also not that difficult. I just had to do that in another thread, otherwise the waiting for a new input would block the main loop on the server. 
Sending commands was a bit more difficult, because in all my execution functions, I expected to have the TCP stream of the sending player available. This of course was impossible for commands from the console, as there is no sending player. Changing that to an option was necessary to fix that. I then had to update all my commands to handle the case of the TCP stream not being available. And with that, I was done with chat and commands, at least for now. There is still functionality missing, like auto-completions. Message signing is also something to look at in the future. And then of course there are many more commands to add. Next time I won't do any of that though, instead we will take a look at loading a vanilla world in my server. You should probably subscribe if you don't want to miss that. See ya then.